This is, uh, let's see who this is. This is a former Confederate officer. I'll give him the talk. Yes. And he surrendered here. He was part of General Lee's army. And he had the shortest walk home of anybody because he lived in Appomattox. And he just happens to be hanging around today. <laughs> and we have encouraged him to talk with some people about his experiences during the war and during this campaign and what it's been like since. And once again, these folks are in character, in costume, in 1865. Mm -hmm. And they're so damn good at it <laughs> that, that I came out here like you as a prisoner. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I am too old to have been a character in ATVs. See, I, I couldn't be a military. I could have owned the bar, I guess. I could try that one. But anyway, come on over here. That's the last building in the town over there. That blue-gray building. That's the home of Mr. George Pierce. Mr. Pierce is the clerk of the court. Okay. You have to start the campaign right about now. General Lee and company are going this way. Okay. They're being pushed by the Army of the Potomac, commanded by Major General George Meade. Now, General Meade had already beat General Lee once at Gettysburg, <laughs> but he didn't follow him fast enough for mm -hmm. the, the President and the Secretary of War to leave him in place. So, anyway. George me. Well, you go down there and you look and there's a piece of artillery pointed that way. And that's the wrong way because there's the enemy. <laughs> Except it tells the whole story. I mean, you can walk away now and you're finished with it, but I wouldn't do that anymore. But anyway, because the damn Yankees got in front of them. See, and, and, and that, uh oh right? And that's the uh oh People will look at that visual, uh, the graphic behind the desk in there. It, it is kind of fun because you can watch them and suddenly they start to do this. Like, well, well, what made them decide to surrender here? And the answer is because I'm a cynical poop. Ulysses Grant is who convinced him to, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, so there, that goes down behind there to a creek and then up on the other side and it's terrain like this. Yeah. That happens to be called Appomattox Creek, but that's mm -hmm. just a convenience, I guess. These buildings were all here in 1865. Mm -hmm. These buildings. Okay. That's the oldest building in the village. Uh, before it was the county seat, before it was Appomattox Court House name of the town. It was merely a stage stop on the Richmond to Lynchburg stage road. And it was called Clover Hill. So that is the Clover Hill Tavern. That's the kitchen for the Clover Hill Tavern. That's the guest house for the Clover Hill Tavern. So that's a compound. As we walk this way, the white green building behind this is the slave quarters for this. Hi. That's hi. Have you have you checked in at the No. Would you check in then if you if you want to join us, this is gonna go on for forty minutes. If you've got we'll have to we'll have to just walk around real quick. Okay he'll 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 give you an agenda. Okay. Okay. That's an attorney's office. And that's the one of, uh, that's the only town store remaining. There were two. The other one was over here. If you look at your map, did, did you put a map on it? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. You, you see a lot of gray structures, which are ones that aren't here anymore. Right. And we'll often get someone ask, well, why don't they rebuild them all? And of course, because smart Alc also. Well, whose tax dollars do you want us to use to do that? <laughs> We've got what we need to sustain the story. Yeah, that, 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 and then we can build it. Yeah. 
And that must be the McLean. That is the McLean house. Because it looks like in the video, you know, upstairs. Well, that's a break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did the something right anyway. <laughs> Let's go and sit over there under that tree. If that's all right. I can't do anything about that. Yeah. The problem where we're sitting is fruit flies. Is that it? Is that it? I understand fruit flies. I speak for one. Now, notice that the road we're on, this is a little bit of a page, it's a 45 degree turn on the front of it. And it goes up over the hill, 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 and it goes up over the hill. That would be the other end of the village. But really, there's nothing between the McLean house and that, so this is, you know, effectively the end of the village. People call all the time, all the time, and say, can you tell me the schedule of the motor coach tours? And we're too small to have motor coach tours. We don't need it. That, yeah, you know. So this is better. Pick out where you think you'd all be comfortable, and I'd like to sit opposite you so I can do this without standing up. Okay. Oh, I'll, I'll move wherever you need me to be. Okay, it would be better if you could get over here where I could. Okay. So you could be. Okay. Would you sit on the other one so I can sit here? Oh, okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Or I could sit over there and look at your back, but I. I, I <laughs> Can you get through? <laughs> okay. General Lee commands the Army of Northern Virginia. He also happens to be the commander of all Confederate armed forces. But in this situation. He's commanding one army. The Army of Northern Virginia, which is comprised of three corps. If you do the organizational chart, that's the next level down. Have you done military times? Okay. Have you? He has. So. I'm, I'm tracking with you. Uh, yeah. well, don't contradict me <laughs> if I'm wrong. If so, I've been wrong a lot of times. <laughs> well. Anyway. The three corps are conveniently designated the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Corps. He has three corps commanders. Now, now, when I do this, I'm talking about stars, because to keep track of everybody, uh, I have to do it in my own mind. And I'm using U.S. Army stars and stuff because the Confederates did it a different way. But, uh, but just to say, consistent. But he's a lieutenant general, and his name is James Longstreet. And James Longstreet's a big guy, big guy, with a beard down to here. Lee refers to him as my old war horse. That's the first corps. He is Lee's deputy also. The second corps is commanded by a major general whose name is John Gordon. The third corps is commanded by another lieutenant general, A.P. Hill. And A.P. Hill is also a Virginian, as well as General Lee. Lee, uh, I've got to quote Lee several times to demonstrate the facts 
of what's happening. Lee said when he was given command of the Army of Northern Virginia, no one will command a corps in my army at that level. No one will ever command a corps unless he's a West Pointer. This is not a job for an amateur. John Gordon is a lawyer from Georgia. Do you think that might mean that he's beginning to run out of talent? See, that, that, that's, it's been going on for four years. Yeah, yeah, you know. On the 2nd of April, 1865, the last railroad serving Petersburg is cut by Grant's forces. Grant sends, uh, people have to say an email, and I know, and, and never mind, a telegraph to Jefferson Davis in Richmond and saying, they've just cut my last railroad and I can't sustain the army without a way to supply them, and I'm going to take the army out of Petersburg and Richmond. And may I suggest you might want to move to the capital, sir, because there's not going to be anybody there to look after you. Lee has been under siege in Richmond and Petersburg, 30 miles apart, give or take, for nine and a half months. The last four months has been on short rations. So the troops are already hungry. And Grant has come down and put them under siege, and then he turns the corner and turns west and then on the 2nd of April, he turns to north and cuts the last railroad, which is the South Side Railroad, which you just drove alongside. Okay, coming here, all right. And A.P. Hill is killed. So now he's got three corps and two corps commanders. And he doesn't have anybody he feels comfortable with to put in charge. So he takes the third corps and gives it to James Longstreet. James Longstreet, it's a good thing he's a big man because he's now got two corps reporting to him, one of which he knows nothing about. Yeah, you know, for those who say, well, it's a very uh, solid army. It isn't. It's, it, it's coming apart. Yep. Okay. So Lee thinks, I'll take the force out of Richmond and out of Petersburg and move them to Amelia Courthouse. There's another one of those courthouse things, which is about equidistant, 35 miles west. Oh, it's raining. It's springtime in Virginia. It's raining. The creeks are overflowing. The bridges are washed away. The fords are seven or eight feet deep. And he can't get the thing together in Amelia. So by the 5th, he's still got half of his army still tied up in the middle of the swamp. Well, he, he knew he was going there, so he had a train full of supplies sent to Amelia Courthouse. And, okay, I'll start feeding these troops that I've got. And he opens the doors to the train and it's full of harness, not food. <laughs> and of course Lee's reputation, well-earned reputation, is he's a uh, solid Christian gentleman. But I'll bet he thought hard thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> because nothing meant more to him than his troops. My troops are hungry, you idiot. <laughs> you know, whoever loaded this train. <laughs> So he thinks, okay, alternatively, let's see, here's the railroad that Jefferson Davis used. It goes to Danville. The ones to Petersburg are all cut. I can drive straight south and pick up that railroad at a place called Burkeville. Take the troops by rail to Danville, give them a rest, and then march them to Durham, North Carolina. In Durham is the Army of Tennessee, but never mind, this is it all gets muddy. It was kind of fun, because at one point, the U.S. Army of the Tennessee was 
engaged against the Confederate Army of Tennessee. One a river, one a state, you see? And so Confederate armies were named after states, Union armies after rivers. So I'm going to go down here. Now let's back up a little bit. General Grant has three armies. He has the Army of the Potomac, which was the standing U.S. Army at the beginning of the war. Under General George Meade. That's an infantry army. He has the Army of the James River. Under General Edward Ord. There's some California linkage here. Yeah, Ord. Yeah. Ord. Yeah. My husband was That's it. Yeah. Same what? As you know. And that's infantry. So we have two infantry armies and a cavalry army, the Army of the Shenandoah River, under General Philip Sherrod. These are all major generals. It might interest you to know, this is a little piece of fun, I think, that General Grant was only the second ever permanent lieutenant general in the United States Army. Really? Yeah. Who was the first one? George Washington. Who else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. But for for some reason, they kept this cap on here. The first full general ever was in World War One, when they were sending the American Expeditionary Force over. And of course, the French had field marshals, and so well, we have to do something better than a lieutenant general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. So therefore, Jack Pershing was a full general. But anyway. So we've got this, and, and riding to the south of all the action is is the Army of the Shenandoah and marches the Army of the James. So the Confederates are being pushed, they can't turn south. Okay. So Lee takes half of his army that's already in Amelia Courthouse and marches south toward Burkeville, gets halfway down. And across the road in front of him is a mass of Union cavalry. Yeah. Lee had been the superintendent of the military academy in the 1850s. And he prided himself of the 200 cadets, he knew each and every one by name and face. So he could. Yeah. And you just get a picture of some kid, 18 year old kid, walking across the parade ground. And oh my lord, here comes Colonel Lee. Morning, Colonel. Good morning, Cadet Schwartz. How are you? Cadet Schwartz is suddenly seven feet tall. The Colonel knows my name. So Lee looks out at the cavalry and thinks that's the army. He had spent 34 years in the U.S. Army. Yeah, so he knew everybody. He looked out there and thought, that's the army of the Shenandoah, and that would be Philip Sheridan, the little snot, was one of those 200 boys. Wouldn't he have to think something like that? Yeah, you know, at best. <laughs> but he civilized that. But so I'll, I'll give him one more lesson. So he starts to unlumber into a line of battle. And by the time he finishes, the cavalry's gone. It's been replaced by the Army of the James Infantry. And one of the standard tactical axioms was cavalry should use its mobility to get in front of the enemy's infantry and hold them up long enough for your infantry to get in place. You see, and that's what just happened. So maybe Lee thought, boy, but I taught him well. <laughs> yeah. But I need to go west because half my army is still in the swamp. So he starts west. That's on the 5th. On the 6th, he's marching through it. And we've got a deep forest. Deep forest. It's so thick the Yankees can't cut it. They can't cut the column. The road was. And along the south side of the forest rides the army of the Shenandoah and marches the army of the James, and you've got to come out sometime, General. Mm. They come out about 50 miles back. 
at a place called Sailor's Creek, which is actually three creeks that keep doing this, but they're just and they come out into a vast open field, bigger than anything we can see here. And three battles begin. Two infantry and one cavalry. And in an hour and a half, they take away 30% of Lee's force. 8,000 Confederate soldiers are gone. Mercifully, 7,700 are captured. Yeah, we didn't have to kill it. Yeah, yeah, no. We, I'm just quoting as that. But anyway, 7,700 prisoners, eight of them are general officers. One of them is Major General George Washington Custis Lee, the general's oldest son. What do we know about Custis? Washington. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we just learned about it. Martha Washington. <laughs> Martha Washington. Martha Washington. Martha Washington. And she is kid to Mary Custis Lee. Mm -hmm. There. So. Lee pushes what's left of the army, which is still a considerable force, into the town of Farmville, which is about 30 miles back. But the troops start going home, the Confederate troops. This army's failing. Yet who's going to look after my family? The Yankees are going to come run rough, rough shot through the south. I have to go home to look after my family. Mm -hmm. Is that desertion? You'd like to think it wasn't, but of course it is. But, you, you, you know, anyway. It breaks Lee's heart. So he's now in Farmville on the night of the 6th. On the 7th, Grant writes the first note. Now, when they were 18 years old, they all learned dignity, respect, and honor. And this is how we treat each other. Right. This is how. Right. So it says, General R.E. Lee, commanding Army of Northern Virginia, sir. It doesn't matter who thinks he's winning at this point in time. He's the senior officer. That's all it is. And then let me paraphrase. He said, the last few days have to have demonstrate, demonstrated that it's not going your way. And I think all we're doing is killing people. And we'd be better off to sit and talk about possible surrender terms for the Army of Northern Virginia. And then the last paragraph is really in its face, at least, face, and surprisingly so. I must lay further effusion of blood on your hands. Yeah. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, Ulysses S. Grant, the captain. Lee's having a meeting that night with his two senior officers. It's the night of the 7th. And they're talking about what we're going to do tomorrow. And when he gets done, Lee says, I don't know what he says. I, do, I don't, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming up with comments that I don't know what they were, but they, it has to be something like I got a note from Grant today. I mean, what would he say? And he read it aloud and handed it to Longstreet as number two. Longstreet reads it, hands it back, says, tell him not yet. Is that an interesting phrase? Not yet. What does that mean, do you think? Do you think it means no? I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you, have you had lunch? Okay. Yes, I have. Okay. I, I'm too late in the day with that one. <laughs> the answer I usually get is no. Will you have lunch? <laughs> yes. <laughs> then have you had lunch and people get it to me? Not yet. <laughs> so it's going to happen. Right? So Lee writes back, that exact thought. I cannot agree with you that we are yet in a position where we need to be talking about surrender terms. And then his last paragraph is, but if you've accumulated some terms, you might want to pass them along for us to look at. See, So, so the troops have started going home. Longstreet says not yet. 
and he's looking to, to, to review the terms, but no, <laughs> you know. I, I don't think any of this is funny, but 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 it's just kind of peculiar the way, the way it all fits. Anyway, so so Lee says whatever I told you about what we're going to do tomorrow, we're changing it. These poor devils are tired and hungry, and now demoralized and ill-equipped. But we have to march them as hard as we can march them tomorrow. We have to march them so hard tomorrow that we can get ahead of the Yankees far enough that we can feed them at Appomattox Station and get them turned to the south before the Yankees can turn the flank. Right? So they push them really hard and get back here about a mile by the end of the day, the other side of the creek. And they're having their evening meeting again. General Longstreet, General Gordon, and Lee's Cavalry Commander. Major General Fitzhugh Lee, who's his nephew. Fitzhugh Lee was a distinguished graduate of the Military Academy. He served with distinction in the U.S. Army. He was an instructor in cavalry tactics at West Point. And he was Jeb Stewart's number two in the Confederate cavalry. So it wasn't a nepotism, that's all I'm getting at. He was well qualified to do with it. But anyway, so there are three of them sitting there. And okay, tomorrow we're going to march the troops in. And by the company, rather than the regiment, by the company, once they finish, turn them south and start building a wall against the Yankees. And they're having this interesting talk, and they hear the sound of battle coming from here. And I suppose, I've never fought any, I've never fought any battle at all. I've tried to avoid it. I, I, I served in the Korean War, but mercifully they didn't want to use me someplace where I got shot at. I'm grateful for that. Um, I don't know where I am in Anyway, if you're fighting a land war and you've got the, you're going that way and there's a battle in front of you, you've got trouble. <laughs> yeah, right. You right have, here in you River have City. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Lee says to John Gordon of Georgia, remember he's a lawyer, I want you to go and secure the road and secure the trains before the Yankees get them. We already know the rest of it. But the Yankees already have the trains, but he can't know that. There's, there's <laughs> yeah. anyway. So Gordon marches up here and he gets about opposite that tree, I guess. And it's springtime now, so there are not so many leaves on the tree. And he looks up behind the cemetery at the gap in the, in the trees. And there are 1,500 Union cavalry up there. Well, infantry is always stronger than cavalry. Cavalry is more mobile than infantry. There we are. So he starts to do battle with that cavalry. And once again, the cemetery isn't there, the road isn't there. This is the road. This was the road after this park opened. That didn't exist. So if you had a nice group of people walking along here, you're liable to be dodging 18 wheels. <laughs> that, that, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> so it didn't take them long to build that. <laughs> I don't know how many people they lost before they built the bypass. Anyway. The battle starts, and they begin pushing them that way. They want to get them off the road so they can march the rest of the Army of Northern Virginia. Yep. Within a hundred yards, the cavalry starts getting replaced by infantry. The Army of the James, having marched 30 miles in 21 hours with 50-pound packs in the red clay mud. Wow. That's amazing. That's it amazing. Is, it is amazing. And you know who would have loved that? My Stonewall son. Jackson. Well, my son would have loved it too. He's Stonewall there, right? Jackson would have loved that. He, he loved great infantry. He kind of preferred the Confederate variety, but he would have admired that because that, 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 that's, that's work. So they, they just keep coming from, from Farmville. Yeah. And pretty soon, John Gordon comes back and Lee is down here. In general, they keep getting reinforced. I don't think I can hold them off much. Now, this is going on here. 
Longstreet's back here fighting with Meade. So we've got two sets of battles going on. And that's every nickel that Robert Lee has in his pocket is in play. There, okay? So in assessing the whole thing, let's see, we've got the Army of the Potomac, and we've got the Army of the James and the Shenandoah mixed cavalry and infantry here. And unknown to him, while all this is going on, and this battle goes on for an hour and a half in the morning, Grant marches another strong column of infantry along the railroad down there, and up here, the other side of the Museum of the Confederacy. Pardon me, I will never change that. Uh, I, I, I know I should. I know that's not the name of it. What is it? The, the American Civil War Museum. Yes, okay, okay, okay. Well, okay. It, they, it's pretty much of the Confederacy, though. Well, well, that's what it was when they built it. <laughs> anyway. But now Lee's got... So Lee thinks, well, maybe that's the only way out over the hill. So he sends a scout up there, and the scout comes back in about 15 minutes, and he said, General, on the next rise, which I suspect is where 460 is, I, I mean, geologically, on the next rise, there are 10,000 Union infantry, and it looks like they're getting reinforced every 10 minutes. And the James River is 10 miles north, and there's no way to get across it. And what are your options, John? He sends a note to Grant, so maybe we should talk. <laughs> Grant holds the messenger, writes back, wherever you want, whenever you want, John. General Lee sends his aide, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Marshall. Lieutenant Colonel Marshall's great uncle was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Oh, really? oh yeah, 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 yeah. You, I, I, I don't think I'm kidding. I, I really don't. I, if, if the Constitution hadn't forbidden nobility, it probably would be along the south side of the Potomac River. Because, you know, yeah, General Washington lives here, General Lee lives here, yeah. Colonel Marshall lives here. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. He sends him in, it's Palm Sunday. The population of the town knows there's a Confederate army back there and a Union army here. And where's a good place not to be today? <laughs> be here. So the town's essentially deserted, except for Wilmer and his family. Wilmer McClain. Colonel Marshall runs into Wilmer and asks him for recommendations. He gives him a couple of recommendations that are really hard appropriate. And finally, McLean says, well, how about my parlor? So they go and look, and that's, what is it? I don't know what he says. Probably thanks him for his generosity, I would think. He goes back and tells General Lee. General Lee writes a note to General Grant. It's now coming up 11 o'clock. How about 1 o'clock in the parlor of the McLean house? At 1 o'clock. Now, I have I've been mercifully in two years, I've, nine years, I've had two letters of complaint. One of them was erroneous. But anyway, the, the one was from a lady from the north who said he talks more about General Lee than he does about General Grant. And Ernie, who kind of runs this place, said, what would you say if, you, if, if she said that to you? And I said, well, the same thing I'm going to tell you. In fact, I didn't write the story. I just tell it. You, 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 you know, I, 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 that's the way it falls out. But anyway. Lee gets here, he sits on a horse like this. It's thought he had two, maybe three heart attacks during the war. But he is the perfect soldier. In the history of the United States, no one has ever completed one of the four-year service academy. Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard. Has never finished one of the four-year programs with zero demerits, except Robert Edward Lee. Right. He's in a new uniform, polished boots. He can, there's a battle going on, for God's sake. But in a ceremonial saber, which... All right. 
He's got Colonel Marshall with him. He wrote to a friend, Lee did. Colonel Marshall and I went to the meeting. I only brought one subordinate because I didn't want to disgrace any more people. Wouldn't you like to know somebody like that? I, I would. I, I, it'd be a treat. And they're there early. No, they're, they're there on time. They don't find Grant until 1 o'clock, and he's 10 miles out here. So he has to come in. And he's got his field uniform on, which is an Army private uniform with three stars. And I tease, a little cigar ash maybe. But <laughs> he doesn't carry a saber. No. Got red clay up to his knees. And he thinks I should go and change, and clean up and change. And he thinks that to do that, and he, in his remembrance, to do that I would have to have made General Lee wait for an hour. And that would have been disrespectful. So I couldn't do that. So you see, he, he disrespected himself rather than disrespected. He shows up a half hour late with his entourage, which is eight subordinates. General Ord, General Sherrod, a couple of other generals, a couple of colonels, a meaningless staff captain, Robert Todd Lincoln. You get a picture of that one. Come along, boy. <laughs> right. This is important, right? Yeah. So he's the first one in the door over there. And Lee has heard him coming up, so he's standing inside the door. How do you do, sir? It's good to see you again. I don't know if you recall, but we met in Mexico. It would have been 17 years before. Lee says, of course I remember, General. It's good to see you again. Lee was a very prominent major. Grant was a brand new second lieutenant. And 17 years later, but what's to be gained by saying no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they come in when Philip Sheridan comes in. He's five foot four inches tall. How do you do, General? It's good to see you again, sir. I'm Philip Sheridan, who was a cadet the last time at West Point the last time we saw. You think he could have avoided either thinking or saying, I know who you are. <laughs> anyway. And they all stand around in the middle of the room and talk about the army. What are the one they shared? And talked about Mexico and mutual friends, and they had hundreds of them. After a while, Lee says, Well, this is just real pleasant, but can we get down to the business at hand? Because he's not having a good time. Grant has a, you'll see when you're down there, a tablet on the table. He's got a piece of paper, and it's got, it's a kind of a topical outline. And he said, well, General, the terms are quite straightforward. First of all, nobody's going to prison. Everybody's going to go home, but you can't fight anything. But you will be prisoners on parole. And next he's got arms and equipment. And what he thought when he wrote it down was, all Confederate-owned arms and equipment will be surrendered in his remembrances, which he wrote while he was dying of cancer, Grant. The government did not provide a pension to either retired presidents or retired generals. Peculiarly, but they didn't in those days. But he said, and so he was writing the book to get money for his family for when he passed. But he said, I got to that place and I looked at that noble gentleman and I could not make myself ask for that saber. So he changed the wording and it was all Confederate ar owned arms and equipment must be surrendered except officers will be permitted to keep their sidearms, sabers, and guns. And then they talk about parole passes, which were printed in the tavern. In the room on the left, there are sample printing presses in there. Um, 
Grant gets finished, Lee thinks for a few seconds and says, the terms are generous, General. The troops will be happy to be going home. And that says so much. You know? And I accept the terms on behalf of our army. We're done. Yeah. Grant hands his notes to his military secretary. He says, put these in proper form. They talk. Lee talks to Colonel Marshall. Would you kindly draft an acceptance for my signature? So they're not one piece of paper. There's two. There's an offer of terms in a separate acceptance. And they talk about the old days, I guess. The colonels are both lawyers, and they're writing proper sentences in paragraph. When I have young people, school kids, I always say, there's a reason why they want you to be able to do that, because you might have to do something important like this sometimes, to write a paragraph. Yeah, you know. um, the moms always love it when I do that. But, uh, they finish the general sign, they exchange them, they talk for a while, Lee says, well, if you'll excuse me, general, gentlemen, I have some considerable work to do. He's got to shut down an army. That would be a chore. They all go out in the porch. And you see where the stairs are. They're in the middle. And Grant said he was standing next to one of those posts, and he didn't say which one, so it doesn't matter, really. But his officers were in line behind him, this way. And... Traveler Lee's horse had been grazing here, and he hadn't called over there. And Lee's on horseback, and he's fiddling with his gauntlets, the reins and stuff. That would keep me from falling on my head. I'm going to get down here and be on my horse. Grant says, I had not thought about the protocol. And when General Lee looked up from the horse, without thinking about it, reflexively he came to attention and began to salute. And that's that is reflexive. Isn't that reflexive? Mm -hmm. but, by the way, they did it this way, but never mind. But somewhere in here, he went through the thought process and said, wait a minute, he just surrendered. You know, that can't be right. General Lee, a very good day to you, sir. Which was a general salute. That's the General Lee reception and the very same to you, General Lee. The whole thing was an hour and a half. And my point is, it was dignity, respect, and honor. It, it was what they practiced all their lives. Uh, the next day, I'm sorry. The next day they met on horseback next to the blue gray building down there. And they were talking about what are we going to do now? We've got two pieces of paper, but we've got 30,000 troops with weapons. So, you know, have we had a surrender yet? No. Okay. We're going to have a parade. Okay. Toward the end of that conversation, General Lee said to General Grant, I don't know if you know this, but I have about 700 new people in prison. And I'm embarrassed to tell you I can't feed them. I can't feed my troops, I can't feed the prisoners. But if you'd like to send rations down for the prisoners, I will see to what they get them. Grant manipulated the conversation around to how many people in your command at this point, Jim. And Lee's answer was he didn't really have a good number, but it was somewhere between 25 and 30,000. That night a wagon train came down here for 30,000 rations going that way. Three days after that, the formal surrender parade of the Army of Northern Virginia, the band of the U.S. Army of the Potomac playing for the parade of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, 5,000 Union troops, 2,500 on each side of the road facing in. They'll march in a division of Confederate troops, stack arms, 
lay down equipment and battle flags were specified. When you're going home, you don't need a battle flag to go home. The honor of being the reviewing officer was given to Acting Major General Joshua Chamberlain, who had been awarded the Congressional Medal at Gettysburg, among other things. He earned it and did a great job in this campaign. But at any rate, he's down at the other end. His full-time job when he's not fighting the war <coughs> is he's a college professor at Bowdoin College in Maine, and he teaches English literature and philosophy. And once again, he's the recipient of the Medal of Honor. <laughs> but he's sitting down there with his philosopher hat on, I suppose, and he said in his, you have to read everybody's stuff, he said in his things that they fought long and well and hard and they deserved not to go out with their tail between their legs. So he gave the order to bring the troops to shoulder arms as Confederate officers passed. We do it this way now. The right one. <laughs> kind of gigantic. There, that right. The first one up is John Gordon of Georgia. Now it's amateur night, right? We've got a lawyer and we've got a college professor. Right? Gordon comes up and he's just so hurt that Lee made him quit. Did I tell you he's been wounded six times? Well, he had. The last one was through his mouth. Right? But he hears the Union troops being called to shoulder him. I'm surrendering and they're saluting. And the people who were there said, he had his horse bow, General Chamberlain, and saluted. That's a saber, in case you General Chamberlain returned the salute, General Gordon returned and gave the order. All officers will salute the Union officers as they pass. So all day long, you've got to salute them. Can you think to yourself, you know, if these people who fought in a war with each other, to put this behind them. Surely we as a country can. And two days later, we can ask And this is, this is when I confess my northern origin. I can be from Arizona all or not, and I have most of my life. But I think this is an opinion. This is, this is an opinion. <laughs> Thank you. I think the people in the North behave very badly because they demanded of the Congress that we punish the whole South for the acts of nine people and conspiracy. And we wondered where the hard feelings came from. The North earned the hard feelings. <laughs> but we're now 152 years away from it. I often. When I have bigger groups, I will have all groups like this sitting around. We've done military time. You, 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 you can usually tell who's been shot at at some point in your life, who has it, it, it kind of reads in here. When I get to this point, about, I think we're over it. A lot, a lot of times get a roll of the eyes. Right? And I kind of ask them, have you ever been shot at that young? When you were being shot at, did you care whether the guy next to you was from the north or the south? And the answer is very not for a second. See, so maybe when push comes to shove, we're over it. In spite of the battle flag. I think it goes one nation under God. Thank you for your kind attention. Sorry to have taken so long, but the story is very interesting. Okay. You can picture the whole thing that way. You know, yeah. yeah. Why? You, you, why you, you know, here? Th th this this was tobacco country though, so it didn't look pretty. Like we like it this way, but that's not the way it, it looked. Not, it was muddy.